um, everyone. Well, welcome to the very first graduation of OLS 7. Folks who are joining us online, <clears throat> thank you for joining. Um, we will be having quite a lot of groups graduating today, um, and we're very excited about that. This is probably very last time as a formal cohort members, these members are uh, sitting with us, joining us from wherever they are. We will be applying our code of conduct today also to this call. And um, if, if any time you have anything to report, please contact me, Patricia or Paz who are on the call. And um, for any information that you would like to share beyond this call, we are also available to be emailed at team at openlifesite.org. We will have five minutes for each presenter. We will not directly take questions if that five minutes is filled by presentation, but we will, towards the end of this call, save some time for different questions to be addressed. And the reason for us to do that is because we are probably um, gonna have 16 presentation today. We need to be very much on time. So are we all ready? Can I get some thumbs up? Happy places. Yes, one, happy one thing. And, and the pad is not working for me today. So I don't know. Who That's comes, okay. Uh, um, if, if folks, you don't have access to it, the pad, please use chat, which is where um, I will make sure that I'm putting in the chat who is the next presenter towards the end of the first presentation and second presentation. So you would know from the chat that it's your turn that's coming. What we are asking each presenter to do is tell us about their presentation um, as a new project name and the link from your project, which we'll, we will share uh, for the rest of the community who are here and who are listening to you as a cohort member, as your friends and colleagues online. So our first team is Saule and Saranjit. Are you all ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> all right, Saule. Please do share your presentation. Um, can you make sure that you have access to sharing? Great. Good. Uh, your so, five minutes starts now. Thank you. So a good day all. Before starting my presentation, I would like to say that I am very happy that I joined uh, the OLS 7 uh, cohort, and I'm very happy to be part of this project. And um, uh, I would also like to thank my mentor, Saranjit Kaur, who gave me a lot of his inspiration and a lot of guidance throughout my journey. So today I will tell you about my project titled Raising Awareness About Open Science Movement in Central Asia. So uh, while open science is an international trend, the involvement of universities in open science practices may vary from country to country. And even within the country, the participation of universities in open science may be different. In connection with this, not all universities may be aware about the open science practices, their values and benefits. The development of open science practices might be unique for different regions, countries, and universities. I personally uh, was involved in open science by volunteering in Replicas project by the University of Melbourne and SCO project by the Open Science Foundation. And recently, I have graduated from a PhD program in education from LT University Budapest, Hungary. And uh, my university has a very great open science team uh, with whom I'm in touch. But I would say that uh, not only in Central Asia, but also in Hungary, where I uh, have uh, graduated from a doctoral program recently, the level of awareness about open science practices is not uh, the same. In connection with this, there is an issue. Existing research shows cases that Central Asian faculty may be overloaded with teaching at the expense of their research activities. In connection with this, teachers might be involved in applied research and their statistical knowledge may not be as advanced as it is required to um, be fully aware of the different opportunities of the open science movement. Furthermore, some researchers may apply statistical methods with the help of their experienced colleagues who possess advanced statistical skills. In connection with this, some universities and faculty might be involved less in, this, in the discussion of issues of reproducibility and robustness, which are currently on the agenda of the international open science movement. 
So uh, during my doctoral research, I studied the theory of localization by an international relations scholar, Amitav Acharya. Uh, in his work, Acharya proposed the theory of localization, which suggests in brief that while international trends may travel from country to country, they need to adapt to the local context to ensure the sustainability of practices. So uh, I planned uh, thinking that I, I, I could help uh, to spread awareness about open science, I plan to conduct a series of lectures dedicated to the history of open science movement, its mission and its benefit for the universities in countries with the developing economies. However, in addition to that, I also had a hidden agenda. I was looking for a localization framework to adapt the open science practices to Central Asian uh, academic and university context. So this is my roadmap, uh, how it looked initially. Uh, my plan was to collect a library of open science books and then create a series of lectures introducing the history of open science uh, movement and then conduct three to five lectures on open science. Uh, it, it, it was further planned uh, and it is still planned to upload a series of presentation on zenodo.org to share with the wider academic community. And the final goal for that purpose would be a framework uh, for adapting open science trend in Central Asian university context. However, uh, not uh, uh, everything uh, went completely according to this plan. So uh, when I started to work on the library, I indeed was able to uh, get access to uh, several important books on open science, which uh, I, I, I planned to use in my lecture. And when I created a library, I started reading and I first started reading from the book titled Transparent and Reproducible Social Science Research, written by Christensen, Fries, and Miguel in 2019. And then when I was reading, a, I had an understanding that while it might be useful to know the history, it is the development of certain competencies and skills that can support open science movement in Central Asia. So as many universities are involved in applied research, not all faculty members have advanced knowledge of statistics and not all of them are aware how uh, certain open science practices can improve the quality of research. So I decided to move my focus from the history of open science to uh, the focus on developing certain competencies. And my inspiration for this focus would be the competence-based approach. So the idea of a competence-based approach suggests that knowledge itself is not enough for people to successfully engage in professional practices. And in addition to raising awareness, it's also uh, important to raise certain skills and competencies of faculty members so they could become uh, more engaged in open science movement. So while I was reading, I had this question that uh, in my head, what skills and competencies are required for a Central Asian University faculty member to be able to participate in open science movement and contribute to open science? And the book that I read uh, inspired me for the following. I suggested Sally, that- Can you uh, wrap it up? Yes, I only have like few few slides left. I don't have many. So basically, uh, I identified a list of competencies for open science, for an open scientist, which include understanding of key concepts like p-value and false positive, understanding of such negative trends like publication bias and specific specification search searching, and understanding of and sincere support for scientific values, including universalism and communality. So I, I held my first lecture on 2nd June, 2023, and uh, I introduced briefly OLS project to 30 faculty members from series three Central Asian countries, uh, the name of which is Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. And in my lectures, I introduced the storytelling technique. So I told them the story of the Diderik Staple, um, a professor who was fired from Tilburg University for fabricating and manipulating data. And I introduced important open science concepts, including uh, reproducibility and robustness and other concepts which are important for our understanding. 
I would say overall, I received a very positive feedback. And uh, because of my experience uh, in my uh, lecturing, I uh, understand now that the focus on competencies needs to be applied to promote open science in Central Asian universities, as well as in universities in, in other countries. And uh, it Thanks, is suggested Sally. to do yeah. Sally, we'll have to unfortunately fin finish here because you're two minutes over time already. Um, yes, but we will come thank back you. to this. Thank you so, so much. Um, okay, thank you very much. Folks, I'm sorry, I'll have to be very brutal with time. I, I'm really sorry for cutting you off, but it was really, really exciting and brilliant presentation. I have a lot of questions and I would keep that for the end of this call. So please join me in thanking um, the wonderful presentation Sally gave and uh, congrats on graduating with really brilliant outcomes. I'm gonna move on to our next set of speakers um, who are Jan, Siobhan, Carmel. Thank you, Malvika. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now so we can start the presentation. So our project um, is Radical Inclusion at Academic Events. Um, who are we? So um, the core team is uh, Siobhan, she's watching as a guest today, um, Daniel and myself. And I recently finished my Master's in Applied Linguistics at Oxford. Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Dan and I'm a computational biologist doing a DPhil in Oxford as well. So first of all, we'd like to thank um, the amazing contributing community that have helped to make this um, project possible. Um, we have um, Kit, Mohammed, Arun, Rachel, Juno, Uma, and Lissy who are busy working on the project with us. And thank you so much to Malvika, who has been our incredibly supportive OLS mentor. She's really helped us um, through some brain teasers and some challenges along the way. Also, thank you to the, all the participants in our discussion groups and the interviews and interviewees and experts that we've consulted, but their um, um, identities have been kept anonymous uh, for confidentiality purposes. So what is our project about? It basically, it challenges the boundaries of what it means for academic events to be truly inclusive. So we focus on practical solutions for access and strategies um, that make potential attendees feel welcome at, at academic events. So the problem statement, academic events, even though there's been significant process recently, they're still not as inclusive as they could be. So the calls for inclusivity often are superficial and they don't have actionable potential and that's what we aim to address. So our motivation for starting this project and for joining the OLS program is that we have either personally experienced or witnessed firsthand the logistical nightmare and the um, the barriers and bureaucratic hoops um, that potential attendees have to go through in order to attend academic events. Um, and the OLS um, project um, provided us with this flexible structure that helped us to structure our project um, and keep on track, but it also has the ethos of openness and, inclus and inclusionary practices which align with our own. So the aims of the project. We wanted to amplify the voices of those that are being excluded and to support organizers aiming to increase inclusivity at the event. And this all comes together with a 10 simple rules paper uh, consisting of ac academic event planning resources that have tangible and actionable advice complemented with practical examples and case studies. Here, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Dan, who's going to continue the presentation. Um. Yeah, so following on the project aims, um, as of now, we have achieved many goals that we have planned. We've onboarded the team of authors, we've finalized the rules and sort of formed the teams around them, and we are halfway to the, almost like full way, to the first uh, draft for most of the rules. Um, and we're planning to do a lot more. These are the examples of the work in progress that we have for each of the rules. Uh, and as you can see, it ranges from uh, committing to including unrepresented communities, uh, location rules such as visa or choosing um, the location, 
and the commitment to a sort of more ethical interaction with workers and community at the destination location. Carmel, thank you. So. Um, and again, these are the other examples. Here you can see we're tackling um, generally the scheduling, the corrective actions, uh, leveraging of networks for fundraising and uh, looking into how can we advance the social aspect of uh, the conferences. However, we have also encountered plenty of challenges along the way. Uh, it's been rather hard to manage multiple time zones, um, which I think have affected uh, everyone, but well, I think all this helped us to learn to manage that and uh, work with it. Uh, the timeline has been another challenge. I think uh, personally, I am uh, a bit delayed on two of the rules <laughs> that I'm doing. Um, and the encouraging people, we haven't quite yet worked out at the beginning uh, how to encourage people to volunteer, how to make them comfortable with the um, leading, but uh, again, with help of Malvika and OLS, we have um, quite successfully worked it out. Um, OLS 7 have been absolutely incredible for us in terms of uh, formalizing the sort of community knowledge that we've uh, been gathering. Uh, it helped us to understand how to have more open communication, how um, doing exercises on vision and roadmap allowed us to put into words exactly what we're planning for the projects and uh, as well as allowed us to understand how to interact with the community that we will and with authors and between ourselves as uh, the leaders of this uh, project. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and so what's next for radical inclusion? So we're hoping to get people to go outside reviews to look into the rules that we have, give of feedback, perhaps adjust certain things. Then we're obviously looking to publish uh, the paper and we want to take this uh, work forward to the development of more uh, robust benchmark and uh, a general community around the topic. And thank you very much for joining us in this presentation. Uh, we're currently looking for reviewers. Uh, so if you're interested, please, and or have any suggestions or questions, please let us know at the email. And we'll also post all the links in the document. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan and Carmel and Siobhan. Uh, please join me in thank congratulating them for graduating. I'm finding my words now. Congrats, congrats everyone so far. Um, and our next speaker is Kiki. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we see okay. yes. Awesome, thank you. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Gigi. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm happy to share my projects I've been working on with OLS on the ethical implications of AI. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So um, since exploring the ethical implications of AI is like a very broad thing to do, I gained clarity during the program with the help of my mentor. And I started somewhere by beginning with analyzing existing and accessible AI policies from different countries and regions. So the aim of this project is to identify patterns, best practices and loopholes across different countries and regions and highlight um, those best practices and provide recommendations for the local for promoting the ethical use of AI. So a little bit about me, I am an AI engineer and I love working on healthcare and social impact related projects. I have a huge interest in AI ethics, especially how it affects underrepresented groups. And this is my mentor, Isil. She, very, she inspired me a lot during this program and she's a postdoctoral researcher in neuro AI and she helped me stay motivated throughout the program. So um, these are some goals that I set during the program. I was able to learn how to set up an open project, which included learning how to set up things like contributor guidelines, embracing open leadership practices and how to promote diversity and inclusion within communities. I also gained a better understanding of AI ethics compared to when I started. I was able to kickstart a comparative analysis of the AI policies and strategy documents from different countries. And I'll be talking about that shortly. 
And also during the program, I came across a lot of resources and also from my mentors. So I decided to like put all of this together into a repository for anyone who would be interested in checking them out. And then I also kickstarted working on the templates for my reports, which will cover my findings after um, going through all these policy documents and possibly come up with recommendations about how these policies could be improved after the analysis is done. So a bit more about the comparative analysis side. So basically the first step about of putting together projects was first finding the policy documents in the first place. So picking a country and searching for the, an accessible AI policy documents that they have, then reading through the policy documents to understand what it covers and then summarizing these policy documents using the available themes that I am a mentor we um, put together and then realizing that sometimes um, reading through AI policies can be a bit boring, so it takes longer than you think sometimes, but it's actually a very fun process. So um, some themes that we were able to cover during the project was um, healthcare, uh, finance, education, infrastructure, data privacy, and public rights protection, regulations on private and public AI solution providers, et cetera. So the next I will talking about is the countries I was able to cover. So in Africa, I was able to find policy documents for Mauritius, Rwanda, and Egypt. For North America, I was able to work on policy documents in the US and Canada. And for South America, I was able to find uh, policy documents in English. So I was able to work on policy documents for Uruguay and Peru. So next, I will be doing a quick demo of the project. Well, first, I'll just tell you what's in the project, in the project website. So this is the repository where you can find guidelines on how the project what the project is about, how it works, and how you can contribute. This is the repository for the resources that I was able to find, covers, books, papers, articles, webinars on AI ethics. And then I will quickly share the website. Okay, I hope you can see the website now. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So this is the website that basically combines the um, policy documents and the projects and the resources. So you'll find the title of the, of the, of the website, the aim and goals of these projects, then the policy comparison table. So this is for Africa, policy documents, and then you find those things that I mentioned earlier about what these policy documents cover. And then if you want to check for other continents available, you find them here by switching these tabs. So these are the resources. So you'll find um, books, papers, articles, influencers that you can follow, organizations working on AI policies and strategies, um, newsletters, communities, courses, and a bit about me. So I'll go back to sharing my slide again. Vicky, um, can you wrap it up? Yeah, I'm almost done, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so um, so the next steps for this project will be to continue summarizing and populating the table with the policy, with the summaries of the policy documents and encouraging contributions to the project as well as making updates to the website. I also hope to build a community around this project and will share my findings as I progress. And also there is a language bar barrier. So I'll be looking, I'll be seeking for help with the analysis for the non-English AI policy documents, such as documents from Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, et cetera. And I'll be sharing my reports that contains my findings and actionable recommendations. So I'll be talking about the future direction for this project, which includes creating a report that details best practices, identifying loopholes, um, creating a document that provides actionable recommendations for improving these policies, and then finding overlaps with, and patterns across different countries and regions and help find what stands out and what countries should be prioritizing. So if you'd like to reach out to me, I'm GG Kenneth. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'll also be available on the OLS community Slack. And I'm grateful for my mentors' invaluable support for me and my projects. Her guidance throughout these 15 weeks were so helpful. And also thank you for the OLS team for the opportunity to be part of this program and the micro grants that I received that helped facilitate this project, this project's development. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not even taking time to tell you all how, how proud I am and how amazed I am with the amount of work 
all the presenters have shown. Well done, Gigi. Please join me in congratulating Gigi. Um, our next speaker is Aditi. Do we have Hi, Aditi on the call? Yeah, great. I'm just going to share my screen. Just let me know if you can see it. Yes, we see it. Do you see only the slides or? Yeah, just the slides. Okay. So hello everyone, thank you for being here today. And my project is about creating an open data blog for computational social scientists or CSS researchers. And my project was built with the idea of providing with a platform for researchers in diverse fields, mainly in computer science and social science to discuss on open data. And the idea was generated while I was searching for resources and guidance to ethically and resourcefully use the social data I was collecting for my own research work. The lack of concrete answers online motivated me to develop a platform which would attract researchers from all walks of disciplines and experience to discuss about issues with each other, where one can post a question or a suggestion and other, and other researchers can answer those along the way kind of like a stack overflow. And the quoted text you see over here was my vision statement, but there were some problems with the initial idea. For example, my vision was too broad and the milestones I set for myself was too ambitious to handle it all by myself. And quite early on the program, I realized that gathering people from different disciplines which was a huge task, especially for someone like me who had no past experience being in the forefront of developing an idea from scratch and single-handedly at that and with much less communication skills. And a lot more connections were required to organize events and even if it's within my university itself. And planning and organizing events required a lot of permissions and pu publicity just to promote the event and get people interested. The timing also did not quite act in my favor as the holidays started and a lot of researchers I planned to reach out to were either away or took longer time to respond. And because time is of the essence, with my research work getting more, I could not dedicate as much time as I hoped for and managing the platform all by myself seemed like a huge task. Regardless of the problems, the amazing sessions put up by the OLS community came in handy and the skill sets taught, like the GitHub tutorials, the community designing and open leadership programs, being in the conversation with my peers as well, helped me shape my idea and improve on the different courses I took along the way. Um, and I learned that in spite of all the setbacks I encountered, I should continue on my path. And through my participation in here, I wish to learn different skills and techniques by attending the cohort calls and learning from my peers and uh, most of all my mentors, all of which had helped me polish my idea and help develop into a fruitful outcome and something achievable. So changing direction multiple times and debuting from my original plan, I came up with some alternate solution. The solution being an open data blog. And given the time constraints I had, the problem I faced so far, I was looking for the best possible way to, uh, to have maximum engagement but with lesser management skills needed and something sustainable for sure. After much discussion with my mentors and a couple of other amazing people in the OLS community, I decided that I would start a blog website instead. And the intention is to have a site where I can put up with all, uh, all the resources I found, which were helpful to me and would like to share with the entire research community. It would provide with a space for me to share about my topic of interest related to open data and my research. Furthermore, invite in people like guests and volunteers to contribute to the site as well regarding common topics of interest and thus providing with the channel to share thoughts and get licensed for all of their valuable contributions. And as a part of my future steps, this is the timeline which I will be following. That is within the next year, I will be focusing on building on my brand engaging with the research community through both in-person and online sessions and inviting collaborators to contribute to the website. And within the next three months, I will be organizing the pages of the blog and compartmentalizing the posts and resources for easy access to anyone visiting the blog site since I just started with that. 
and then from September, promoting and posting valuable content at regular intervals to ensure that the posts reach the target audience, that is the CSS researchers. And then starting from December, I will be discussing the idea of open data to researchers across the discipline and using the blog to provide examples and spark interest in people to engage and contribute. But of course, promoting the idea of open research is not limited to myself. Hence, from March of next year, I will actively invite in guests, uh, guests to contribute to our, um, in our shared interest in open research through the blog. And these are some valuable lessons which I learned through the OLS journey I had, uh, like starting a project from scratch and managing it single-handedly by myself and expecting the unexpected, which is something I believe my fellow co-participants will also agree with. And that is all about my project. Thank you, Lois, to my mentors, Riva and Laura, for your valuable feedbacks uh, in our mentor-mentee meeting. And thanks to the OLS organizers and my co-participants. And special thanks to Malvika and Emma for your valuable inputs, which helped me get uh, set up the website. Thank you all for listening in. Thank you so much, Aditi. Uh, well done, well done. Congratulations for your graduation. We have our next set of speakers. Uh, are they ready? Yeah, go for I'm, it. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Wonderful. So thank you very much. It is a, a pleasure to present this project here in the OLS uh, uh, meeting. So this project is called Closer to the Sky, co-creating astronomical knowledge in the PPG favela complex of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, it has been developed uh, by me, Ariana, Claudia, Gabriella, and Maria, who are astronomers and undergraduate student in astronomy, and we are engaged in astronomical outreach. Also, this project has the fundamental participation of people from the favela, especially artists and educators as Claudio, Yanni, and Acme. And while developing the project in the OLS scheme, we also included the other collaborators from different fields of research and different parts of the world, creating a constellation of people. So in this picture, you can see the favela of uh, the PPG, which is Cantagallo, Pavao, and Pavonzinho, as uh, these little houses on the left, uh, in contrast with the big buildings on the right, uh, which is already a sign of the inequality that's present in the city, and that's a reflection of the social injustice and racial segregation that is directly connected to Brazilian histories of colonization. And those facts motivated us to develop this project where we aim at creating and achieving mental well being for children and teenagers of the community, as well as promoting quality education and support culture and empowering people of the community, also achieving some of the United Nations social developing goal. And we aim of doing, uh, achieving this goal of doing this project using astronomy and art. Astronomy for is uh, power of fascinating and also restoring people's soul and art, which is a vibrant part of the favela culture and is a way for them to preserve their identity as well as uh, having a decent income of money. Unfortunately, yet the culture from the favela is very marginalized within the society. So our vision is to co-creating astronomy and arts curriculum an open educational resource together and for young people of the PPG favela in collaboration with artists and people of the community. And I'm gonna pass now the word to Claudia, that's my colleague, and gonna explain exactly how OLS enter in this game. Hi, hi everybody, thanks Ariana. So uh, we brought this project to OLS as an idea and it then throughout the program evolved into a prototype and also something more. It is a participated science project. So um, 
some of our big challenges are uh, of course achieving trust uh, and the proper community engagement so we wish to adopt the open science uh, paradigm from the beginning and um that's how why we brought this project to to the program during the program we learned how to to structure roles and responsibilities in such a wide uh, project uh, and we learned a lot about licenses how to credit content and most importantly i, I would say is uh, what it means to make the project uh, to make a project open by design so uh, if you can change the next slide, we arrived with these huge, uh, big goals to address inequality with uh, with astronomy and art. And uh, our, when we started with, with Open Canvas, it was all over the place so with big problems, um, not so focused solutions. So in the next slide, you can see um, very much thanks to our mentors, Graciele and Sabrina, uh, we... Um, they pushed us to, to break down the project into uh, minimum viable project uh, products that we could uh, that we could have um, somehow ready towards the end of the program and also keeping a, a long term vision. So, being four, we split into into four different aspects of the project. So we we uh, retooled our different canvas on various uh, so from the educational content to the classes, the training. Uh, uh, artists and of course fundraising so in the next slide you can see um, some snapshots from the project today so we uh, are offering uh, free astronomy classes for young children at the cultural center Nino da Agias in uh, in the PPG complex of Rio and next week we also start uh, uh, classes for for teenagers and uh, um, this you can see also our collaborator uh, Maria and uh, Claudio in the, in the picture. So uh, clarifying our vision helped us a lot in uh, one of the goals, which is also write a proposal for funds. We need funds to support our contributors from the community. And in the process, we also gain new collaborators from different fields in Brazil and abroad. And one in particular was uh, from the, the contact uh, with an expert that was provided through our mentors at the Instituto Brasileiro de Direitos Autorais, uh, but also from a variety of fields close to astronomy and not. So that improved uh, a lot the project, uh, but we're still... Uh, um, of course, open to, to further collaborators and contributors. So if you are uh, a cultural project, uh, if you are or know of cultural projects in Brazil and Latin America, uh, reach out, but also elsewhere in the world. If you're a content creator, editor, web editor, artist, educators, English teacher, we also offer uh, free English classes to to the children, uh, please get in touch. There's the uh, the email address there for, for the project uh, and uh, the astronomy club. Um, and uh, in our um, next slide, there's our, our roadmap so far. So we, during the program, we focused on uh, uh, implementing the course, the classes and fundraising. Next to the, um, of course, if you also know of funding bodies, please let us know. We will apply for more. Next to the to the classes, we also um, we are implementing educational resources, but they it's a syllabus that is coming together as the classes go on. So we develop it unit by unit. It's a uh, decolonial science uh, education, and uh, we aim at publishing it as a open educational resources. Hopefully, towards the end of the year. And then later next year, we'll also implement the collaboration with artists and train the first cohort of astronomy guides. Uh, of course, uh, the, the roadmap actually looks a whole lot more, uh, more structured. There are some goals we've managed to already reach uh, within the, pro the program and a lot more for, planned for the rest of the year and, and next year. You can find more about it uh, on, on, our, on the, our GitHub uh, on our project GitHub, and then I leave you with uh, our motto uh, that only uh, with knowledge co-created by and for people that have been excluded long from the science, the formal science process, we believe that science can truly be open and 
I leave the floor to, to Gabriela for a final uh, quick, very quick introduction. Hi, I'm Gabriela. I'm Maria. We are uh, undergraduate astronomy, astronomy students from Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. We are part of the team Closer to the Sky, and I help in the development of the courseware to the uh, PPG in Das Águas. And Maria teaches the classes for children and teenagers. Thank you. Amazing. So, um, congratulations, everyone. Wonderful project. Um, I have to remind all our speakers that there have been a lot of notes in the etherpad, lots of congratulations and beautiful comments on the chat. Um, all, of, all of you are such strong activists and I cannot stop admiring how much work all of you have done. Well done, the recent team. Our next speakers are Sandrine. Um, yeah, one speaker, Sandrine. Do we have them on the call? I see Sandrine has, there you go. Are you ready to present? We don't hear you. Yes. Okay. What I'll suggest to the rest of us. I'm going you. to share my screen. There, I would ask Are you seeing my screen? There, Sorry, uh, one second, Sandrine, we just get some logistics sorted. Mm -hmm. Folks who have the video on, can you turn it mm -hmm. off so uh, it's a bit easier for Sandrine to speak? Okay. You yeah, your internet isn't great. Uh, we can't really hear you clearly. Could you try once more? I see everyone has turned off their camera. Hopefully this is easier. Can you see my screen? We do see your screen, but your voice is breaking. Okay, can you try once more? Wow. Okay, I think I think it's getting better. Okay. Can you see my screen? We see your screen and I hear you better. Can can I get some thumbs up from other folks? Uh, Sandrine, get started. Um, and if you see that we can't hear you, keep an eye on the chat. Yes, I try to to share. Yeah, can you can you go ahead with your presentation? I do see the screen. Yeah, we see it properly. Sandrine, can you hear me? Okay. Um, for passing the floor to me. Uh, good day to all. I am Kenya Sandrine. I would first like to apologize for the language with French accent. Yes. Um, okay, this presentation is about career and innovation in culture. Yes, you can hear me. You don't hear me. We hear you. Go ahead. We hear Can you. You hear me. Okay. 
Folks, we're having some internet issues. Could you hear me? Okay, my presentation is about development of a tool for the diagnosis or prediction of growth. Well, my presentation is uh, about development of a tool for diagnosis or prediction of growth failure and its prevention in premature infants. Can I continue? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Okay, Sandrine, I think uh, I'm going to coordinate with you uh, separately. Do you can hear me? Can I ask, sorry, can I ask Patricia? Uh, Wow. Do you hear me? It has been, yeah, sorry. There has been some delays. So I'm going to hand it over to Patricia. I'm going to coordinate with Sandrine um, in the chat directly with her, and we'll go ahead with, this, with the next speaker and hope that uh, we can bring her back. Thank you, Malvika. Um, Sandrine's slides are available um, are already on Sonoda. I'll put the link in the chat and we can maybe share that elsewhere. So if anyone is interested, um, you can have a have a look at those slides already and um, maybe put uh, questions in in the etherpad. Um, but yeah, up to the next team ready to graduate. Bizola and Deborah, are you ready to present? Yes, we are. Hi, sharing now. Okay, can everybody see my screen? I can see that you have started screen sharing, but the slides aren't showing for me yet. Oh, how about now? Good? Now they're here. Now they're good. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Deborah, and my teammates and I worked on a project we like to call the Somnus Project. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the immense efforts our mentor Aswati put into this entire 15 weeks. It's been a really long journey. So I'll head right into our project. So what are we working on? Our project is titled The Impact of Sleep Deprivation on Mental Health. So essentially, the problem is that we noticed a global decline in the sleep hygiene, particularly in the tech industry. So we decided to do a study that essentially addresses, tries to assess the sleep patterns of some group of techies and how it directly impacts their psychological well being. Next slide. Okay. So there's a common saying here among the Nigerian techies sleep is for the week. You can find someone awake at 2 a.m. in the morning and they tell you they're not asleep because sleep is for the week. There's this tendency to tilt towards losing sleep just to meet deadlines and to feel extremely efficient. But of course, we recognize that there was a slight dysfunction there. So we decided to do this study, publish an open access journal that will help out in future studies that will build interventions around sleep hygiene and encouraging better sleep patterns. So project milestones, what were the major milestones we achieved during this period? For one, our scope was way larger than a two woman team could handle. We had initially planned to do the study for the entire world. As our mentor would tell you, we're very ambitious. So she helped us narrow our scope down to just techies in Nigeria. 
And then we also created our open canvas roadmap and GitHub repository where we have all the project resources stored. And we did this using open science principles. We also built our vision statement. And I want to thank everyone who commented on our GitHub issues. You really helped us define our vision and mission better. Currently, we're working on a qualitative data survey analysis. We're building it around the PSQI, and we're also going to be getting social demographic data. We also have a data management plan that essentially has these survey questionnaires that will be done using Google Forms, and then the responses will automatically be uploaded into Google Sheets where the data will be stored. Then afterwards, we're going to compile this using advanced data analysis techniques based on the recommendations of a data analyst and then social demographic data will be summarized using descriptive statistical analysis. I'm going to hand it over to my teammates to talk more about the challenges we encountered along the way. Isola. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Visola and I'm getting into OLS for us um, was inspired by you. And um, it, we had the idea for the project, but we didn't really know what open science was. So our journey in OLS has really helped us, um, has really educated us on what open science is. And um, it has created an avenue for us because before now, we kind of, we actually thought open science was um, synonymous to just putting our project out there and everyone just seeing. And then um, coming here, we learned that it is much more than leaving our project available on the internet for anyone that wants to have access to it. And then we've also learned through the workshops and our mentor, thank you Aswati, um, how to narrow down and um, what open science entails. The open framework and um, our mentor had shared with us foster open science where we went through a couple of courses that really introduced us and opened our mind to what open science is, and without which wouldn't be possible with OLS in the first place. We also learned that through open science, we can confidently share our work and ask for feedback as we did with our vision statement um, for peer review, which is very, very, I would say, very um, liberating. Having people be able to tell you uh, what is wrong and what you can do better is quite very helpful. And then um, for the first time, we also learned that there are structures to be put in place in sharing our work for proper accessibility and inclusiveness, which include the data management plan, my teammate has mentioned as um, along with the code of conduct and contribution guideline and roadmap. All of this um, helps people who want to contribute, know what we are, where we are going and where we are right now, <clears throat> which wouldn't again have been um, possible without OLS. So we really appreciate the education that we get from OLS in knowing what open science is. Coming from science background, this was not something we were knowledgeable about. And um, being able to see that there is another aspect of science out there that we have not tamed or that we do not know was very, very satisfying for us. And um, next, I will be talking about our project challenges, which is um, um, where we want to be. And that is eventually to <clears throat> eventually to have a, an open access journal. And then um, to get there, we have reflected that yes, this project is bigger than the two of us, even um, narrowed down, especially since we don't know a lot about data analysis and some other um, key aspects that we would need. So we would appreciate contributors in the areas of data analysis, health or psychology research. And currently we are working on building this um, project profile on our GitHub where we can have a full data management plan and every detail possible for contributors that would like to join. And um, after doing this, the next phase, the next phase would be um, going into the beta phase, which is the recruitment of participants through the data collection phase. And from there, we would know where to go. Here are project resources. They are also they are present on our repo. And um, finally, we say a very big thank you to everyone that has helped us, our mentor, Yo, and Paz, every single person, and the uh, co-OLXers who has um, 
commented on our GitHub and given us an idea or two on how to really work on our vision statement and um, our open canvas and how to make it better. Thank you very, very much. Amazing, wonderful. Thank you so much and congratulations for graduating. I love the quote that the journey matters more than the result. I think that is uh, very much the, the, the motto of, of OLS that, uh, you know, we, we hope you learn um, a lot in these 16 weeks and it's not necessarily what you think you will learn uh, when you applied with, with your project. Um, so uh, everyone join me in congratulation to, to the team graduating and uh, Danny I hope is ready to Hello. share and go. I can see the slides. Doris, you're perfect. Um, all right. Hello, my name is Danny. I'm representing the Translate Science Initiative, um, and I just want to tell everyone about our to come to the list. We started in 2021. Um, our founder was Victor Venma, and the group grew to include many people passionate about multilingualism in science. Um, however, in 2022, we lost Victor, um, and we relied on him so heavily for our group cohesion. Um, folks may recognize this is his picture on that. Um, so we applied to the OLS seeking to formalize um, some sort of shared governance model so that we could have a structure that could allow us to be sustainable and that we would be able to recover from any loss of one member or if people needed to switch out. Um, we just realized we didn't have any structure around those types of things. Um, and so during the OLS, uh, we were matched with our mentor, Ailish O'Carroll, uh, who we thought was a great fit because uh, she's very interested in multilingualism in her work with Elite's ambassador program. And uh, we also, uh, so what we, the structure we sort of took is we already had bi-weekly meetings for Translate Science. So we slotted in on the alternate weeks to meet with Ailish and have some sort of um, guidance as to how to approach this uh, task of trying to uh, create a shared governance model, uh, figure out how to debrief from the exercises that we did with the group um, and what to do for the next meeting. Um, she also helped us connect to some other resources like Monica Granados. And from her, we learned about the process that pre-review took to become an OLS project and then become very independent um, and just realize sort of like the scope of the challenges we might be facing, especially as an all volunteer group. So one of the first activities that we did was we worked collaboratively on two uh, open canvases. Um, I'm just providing them here uh, so people can see some of the work that we did, but I don't expect anyone to really dive into it. But what's important to re recognize is that we had to split our canvases into two because uh, we had the the bulk of the Translate Science project, like trying to, um, you know, promote multilingualism and all this interest and passion for multilingualism in science. But then we had the core of our OLS project, which is trying to figure out governance, and they had sort of different design constraints to them. And in doing this, we had a major challenge uncovered, where our members we wanted to do everything related to translation in science, but we were all volunteers, and we didn't have the capacity, and we don't have the capacity to execute all of these designers. So the primary thing that we, we focused on then for the OLS was to align our main focus. And we investigated three different options that could be. We could have been a think tank advocating for multilingualism in science. We could be a community of interest around multilingualism. Or we could be some sort of organization modeled a little bit after pre-review to produce volunteer produced translations. Um, and so it took time <laughs> to build this uh, community consensus we all had to understand like what the definitions of these three paths were and why do people want to be in this group? Um, and yeah, and that, and that took time. And uh, I think it was a good process to go through because ultimately it gave us all an understanding of why we each were volunteering to be a part of the open life, being a part of Translate Science. Um, and then also be able to speak about uh, like where we wanted to go. And so we use this voting mechanism where we took uh, five votes over three different options. And you know the vote numbers were important, but we also try to emphasize why each member decided to vote this way so that we could understand each other and what we were bringing to the table, what we were getting out of the situation. So ultimately we decided to be um, a community of interest. And so for our next steps, 
um, we want to design a, a structure that can have this core contributor group. Uh, everyone who's been meeting has essentially, I've been considering this core contributor group, um, but we'll probably revise the group description um, and uh, set up a roadmap. And ultimately we'd like to invite other people to come join us in some of the roles that we define so that, um, yeah, we can, we can continue to build our, our community of interest. Um, so if you want to participate, uh, please send us an email or, or come to our next meeting. Um, and this is some of our contact information. Our slides are up on um, Zenodo, um, so you can see them there. And I just want to thank everyone who's helped us so far, especially uh, Jennifer and Ailish. They were the ones that were um, attending with me, the mentor-mentee meetings, and helped us really have like a, a sort of like outside view of uh, the community that I've been in for some time, not very committed at that time, but now, you know, more committed. <laughs> and um, I do want to also point out um, this person who I feel like we haven't got a chance to thank, uh, Aslan. They, um, they helped us transition the, uh, the infrastructure when we lost Victor uh, so we could still maintain control over um, the blog and the website and so forth. And, and I think that was very critical. So again, um, our presentation is here and um, thank, thank you all for listening. Thank you so much. Amazing. Uh, Pass, are you taking over? Feel free. No, no, no. Go. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you and congratulations. That was uh, that was uh, a, a great uh, overview of your project. So well done for all the work. Governance is hard. Um, so good job. On, on that one and um, I hope some people get get in touch um next up is I don't know if it's Lessa or Fabrice or I don't no not not sure what what your right name is but that's someone else sharing their screen now. Uh, Sandrine, we can see your screen. Can you uh, stop sharing, please? Or are you sharing on behalf of Lessa? That is Sandrine, I think. Yeah. These are Sandrine's uh, slides now. I'll stop Sandrine's slide sharing. Um, Lessa, do you have any slides? Yes, yeah, I have my slides. Okay. Can you see my screen? There we go. Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, J. Everyone. Um, the the lack of good uh, research proposals and topic for graduate and undergraduate students uh, in Cameroon led to the proposal of this project. So, um, as a lecturer today, I've discovered that most HND students are fond of proposing. Uh, research topics that does not really help the development of agriculture in Cameroon. So we find uh, one of the discussions that we, uh, we, we had with them was the in inaccessible funding to really carry research um, at a higher uh, standard. More to that, the insufficient funding. And uh, this is what led us to, to propose to develop a platform that will link researchers students and lecturers. Why? Because we also found lecturers that have good research proposals but can't find students, for example. And more to that, we have enterprises and other organizations who, have, who can really work on different topics, but students are not, uh, are not there or not, are not quite available to really work on it. So we, we thought that the, to, the, the provision, for example, of um, data, bioinformatic tools and financial assistance and designed the platform. This can really link up teachers and uh, um, 
funders, uh, students on a platform where they can share even opportunities and, and the rest. So at the level of the community, we thought of empowering these, research, uh, these students on research methodology, proposal writing, and grant writing and management. Because uh, most of these students are fond of like um, discussing with, uh, with some of us on the, the, the methodology to, to write, for example, a good proposal, more to that um, grant writing and management. At the level of the, the profiles and channels, we students, researchers, and any other person having the desire to learn. I would, I would like to remind that this is uh, the canvas that we have to, to draw for, for our project. And for the contributors, uh, we have the university and research institution, biologists, biologists bioinformaticians, and agricultural students. And here, the strategic communication, open science, and bioinformatics. So, the title of the project is development of an open of an online open science platform making science research easy and accessible for agricultural students in Cameroon with the main aim to contribute to the quality and adaptable research work through the practice of open science in Cameroon. So what we have done so far is uh, the GitHub uh, the platform. We could uh, provide an open Canva, a readme file and a route map. And we have invited uh, some uh, collaborators. Most of them are part of the, of the OLS 7 that will really uh, help us in contributing to the development of this platform. So how you can contribute here is to redefine, refine the concept, uh, improve in coding, and together we can uh, put a style guide to help the product have a consistent visual, visual design. So the difficulties that we've encountered in now was the time management. We had some uh, difficulties to, to work together as a team because each and every one of us had uh, different activities. The collaborators too, I was left on my own to really work on uh, this uh, on these projects and more to that, the, the coding skills. But uh, one of my collaborators uh, is, um, is a computer science and promises that uh, for the next month, we are going to really work deeply on the, this project. So what we have learned at first, I had to propose uh, this topic at the um, OLS, genome-wide analysis of cyclophilin gene in yang. Actually, this is a project that I really carry in heart, but uh, after discussing with the OLS team, uh, this project in the uh, court six could not, uh, could not be validated because it was not sharing the view of the OLS science. So, so far I've learned what we call open project, which led me to, the, uh, to this um, uh, project now, which uh, uh, I really succeeded to be validated, to be accepted in OLS, OLS seven. So talk, talking of the achievements so far, uh, this is what I have proposed um, at, uh, when I was applying to like uh, be, to be, to be a practitioner of open science that I think that I am very good at that now. Uh, development of skills to become a mentor, which is quite good and develop my bioinformatic skills, which is fair and science, science communication is uh, very good. But apart from that, I've also developed um, uh, open project setup, community design, and open leadership. And I really thank the, the OLS team. So I'll conclude with the, this uh, citation from UNESCO, making sure not only that scientific knowledge is accessible, but also that the production of that knowledge itself is inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. With this, um, thank you for all the support uh, to the OLS team. Amazing. Well done. That is great work. Um, uh, I love the specific call, calls for help uh, where people get involved. It's, uh, amazing to see. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, 
fact, congratulations for uh, graduating from OLS 7. And um, also lovely to see that, you know, even if you um, weren't part of the cohort uh, uh, six, you, you like rescoped your project and you've now successfully graduated from OLS 7. That is amazing. Right. Last but not least, we have one presentation left. Angelica, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, okay. and now we can also see your slides. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, so um, good day, everyone, whatever you are in the world, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this program and to present you my project today. I'm Angelica, and what I'm going to show you is a database of OLS projects, so you might recognize uh, your names and projects in my own projects. So before I dive into the, the specifics of the project, I want to acknowledge the support of, of some people, of course, the whole uh, OLS community, but uh, more specifically, I uh, want to thank Lena, uh, my inspiring mentor, and Berenice, she was the expert who guided me through the project. And I also want to thank my husband and my colleagues because they gave me the time and space to, to work on this, you know, alongside my, my daily job. So I'm a social scientist by background and I'm a data manager. I wanted to learn more about open science. So I saw the open life science program and I was very excited. But at the same time, I was a bit thrown off by the term life sciences. And so I, I wanted to look at the project to see if I could find something related to the social sciences that I could relate to. Uh, but it was a bit difficult to navigate because all the projects were nested uh, under the different cohorts. But that actually gave me the idea uh, for my own project to develop uh, in the in the OLS program. And so my, my project is actually to build a searchable database of OLS projects to make it easier to navigate for past, current, and future OLS participants. And bear in mind that I think that this is a problem that many organizations have. When they support many projects, it, it can be difficult to navigate the complexity. So this is also something that can be reused by other organizations and other groups. But OLS is the excuse to to work on a first prototype. So I started as probably most of you with the planning and designing phase. So I used the canvas, the roadmap, uh, vision statement, but then I went into the specific of the project. I needed to get some input data and then the expert Bernice helped me out a lot by pointing out to the data that was already out there. Then I wanted to clean and enrich uh, the data. Um, I tried to do it all with scripts so that other people can do it and improve it in the future. Then I had to create a database and for this I used uh, Markdown. And finally I had to publish it. You can already see the, the prototype by following the link or scanning the, the QR code. I will also show a screenshot in a second. But the one I want to point out here is two key learnings. So first, I set up my first proper GitHub repository, which is something that everybody was looking forward to. And I also learned the importance of documenting the steps. This is because some people uh, out there had already done uh, something similar, but it took me days to figure out all the single elements. And now I try to write it down and I hope that it's going to be easier for others to follow the same workflow. This is the how the, the database looks like. It's a, it's a website with a big table with all the projects. You can see that the names of the participants and the mentors are linked to, the, to their uh, GitHub handles. You can sort the columns based on uh, alphabetic order. You can use a search bar to look for specific keywords. And I also managed to add the domain, so social sciences, um, and uh, natural sciences or life sciences, for some of the projects, not all of them, unfortunately, but for some of them based on the keywords. So that's something that ideally can be improved and extended in the future. And um, of course, when I worked on my roadmap at the beginning, I had some building blocks and alongside the journey, it turned out that I had either underestimated or overestimated most of the effort of, of most of these blocks. 
But I think this was very important for me as a learning process uh, because it was really helpful to keep revising the roadmap to be responsive to changes, but also thanks to my mentor, making sure I wouldn't lose sight of the end goal. So I, I was very stuck with the data cleaning and the enrichment. And then I was, you know, letting go of the final idea to having the search database. But my mentor helped me to, you know, keep the keep the boat going and not forgetting that there was also the, the end goal there of creating the, the searchable database. Um, there is still a lot of work to do, so I hope to be able to keep working on this. And the input is, is very much appreciated. If you have any ideas about other information that you would like in the database, or if you have actual time or willingness to help annotating this, it would be very helpful. And I also hope in the future that this will be uh, better integrated in the OLS website to improve it, of course, also from an aesthetical point of view, but also to be better embedded in the community. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, so I probably have to skip this. I just wanted to say that some of the seeds are already blossoming in my daily work, but I think I close now and thank you with the word cloud of the keywords of your amazing project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and congratulations. Uh, that is uh, wonderful work. Um, Sandrine, you're sharing your um, screen again. Should we try and squeeze you in? Could you like try and unmute again? I can't hear you. Hello. Now we can and we can see your slides. Do you want to try again? Okay. Um, thank you for passing the floor to me. I I don't know why. My presentation is about uh, development of a tool for diagnosis or prediction of growth failure and its prevention in premature infant in Cameroon. Could you hear me? Yes, we can. Go on. Okay. In introduction, I can say that. If premature infant growth is a complex process conditioned by many factors, including genetics and environment. During this process, we can observe fetal growth restriction or postnatal growth failure. And fetal growth restriction is a, more, is a major complication of pregnancy and is associated with stillbirth, infant, and Dead, uh, infant death and child morbidity. Postnatal growth failure is a complication of prematurity, which is a public health problem, given its magnitude and its strong association with infant mortality. But in our context, there is a lack of suitable local reference curve and lack of consensus on the use of existing curve for diagnosis. And there is also a few published study on factor associated with growth failure and its prevention. At the outset, of, uh, at the outset we have several objectives, but after following the training of open science and have carried out, out activity with uh, an exchange with uh, our mentor, we finally opted for this final objective, make three-term growth that are widely understandable in order to propose solution for the diagnosis and prevention of growth failure through collaboration. We were enabled to achieve this objective, especially as regards the diagnostic and prediction tool, because data, especially premature growth parameter, were not available in time. Nevertheless, we were able to identify a number of factors 
from which we have proposed uh, action for uh, to be implemented and monitored at the level of primary health care post or at home in family to prevent growth failure in large resource context. Uh, the associated factors were as follows. Factors related to mother's condition like maternal infection, exposure to toxin substance, maternal chronic disease. Factor, we have also factors related to fetal condition and factors related to postnatal growth. To all these factors, we propose activities for fighting against growth, failure during preconceptional period and pressure with many activities, improve maternal nutrition, integrate antenatal care fighting against toxins and for after birth we propose management infection and comorbidities improve newborn nutrition concern we were able Became a collaborative project. We also have an introduction to GitHub. We learn how to set up a community through a vision, a Renify, a mission, a pathway, persona, a code of conduct, and a guide for contribution. We also learn uh, the different aspects of open science through UNESCO definition and Concerning her, less, we had difficulty with the completion of our basic data, and there is also a language barrier. What comes next? Uh, after analyzing the data, we intend to develop an, an appropriate curve for the evaluation of premature newborn in our city and create an application open to all for predicting the growth of premature baby in Cameroon. We also want to create an association to help family of premature newborn with an online website for the association and our community. You can contribute by following this link. And I thank you. I thank you all for, for support. I thank you, my mentor, and all the team of OLS program. Thank you. Amazing, Sandrine. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we managed to um, get you to present. That is a really, really important work. Uh, so congratulations, and uh, thank you so much thank you uh oh that was um the last presentation in this graduation session um everyone um join me in thanking and congratulating um again on the 10 projects that graduated today well done everyone really, really amazing work across the board. Um, we don't have time for any questions and I also wouldn't know how to pick any, but like um, project leads, please keep an eye on the etherpad and any comments that have been left there and um, use that as an opportunity to um, yeah, follow up with people and get them into your project teams and uh, you know recruit them to help you going forward um so thank you all the project leads for presenting thanks everyone on youtube who has um, joined uh, us watching there thank you pass who has done the work in the background to make that possible um and with that i say like Congratulations and well done for graduation one and see um, 
some of you maybe tomorrow for more wonderful projects celebrating the end of uh, um, their OLS 7 um, journey. Thanks, everyone. Oh, we forgot. Oh, did we forget uh, uh, to take a picture? I know. Don't know if we would have needed we a can, um, picture. If we can. Is we can around, stop the the streaming. Uh, we can stop yeah. the streaming, um, and then we can take a picture so you can feel more uh, and get prepared.